we get started, I'm uh, Malcolm Chalmers from Rusi, and we have uh, an all Scottish uh, podium uh, today, uh, which is may or may not be a good thing. You'll, you will no doubt find that shortly uh, to talk about uh, the security implications of possible uh, Scottish independence. And for good or for ill, we are engaged in a very long lead time uh, up to the referendum next year. I, I was reminded earlier that I think we've got around 500 days uh, of further debate on this issue in front of us, and we've had quite a bit uh, already. Um, but I think uh, that means that by next September, uh, we should have gone over these issues, all the issues involved in that vote, uh, to an extent that perhaps it's very difficult to think of any other country faced with this sort of decision that has gone on to the, in, into the issues at such great length. Uh, hopefully, uh, one of the roles that Rusi can play in this debate is to ensure that it's not only length and noise, but there's also actually uh, some real analytical uh, depth uh, to the discussion. And what's clear to me is that in a world where there's a lot of talk about globalization uh, and interdependence, uh, states still matter. It still matters uh, whether or not uh, this island has two uh, governments uh, or one. It does matter whether Scotland is independent uh, or not. And uh, defence and security is at the heart of what it means to be independent in today's world. And it means, of course, that an independent Scotland would have the right to say yes or no to issues of defence and security, but it also means that an independent Scotland would have ultimate responsibility for providing defence and security to the people of Scotland, responsibilities that currently reside uh, here in London. For all the talk about partnership there may be uh, after separation, ultimately responsibility would lie in national capitals and not in that partnership. And to address those and many other questions connected with defence and security, and we're not only talking here, I think, strictly about the military, and we're talking about defence uh, and security more generally. To address those questions, we have a very distinguished panel indeed. I think it's hard to think of a more distinguished panel uh, of Scotsmen uh, uh, with experience in this area. We, of course, have Angus Robertson MP, who's the Westminster leader of the Scottish National Party, uh, but also uh, one of the SNP's leading experts in defence and security issues, and indeed the author uh, of their uh, defence policy statement, which was approved by their party conference last year. We have in uh, uh, Sir Ming Campbell, of course, uh, not only a former leader of the Liberal Democratic Party, but one of the most distinguished and knowledgeable uh, commentators uh, from Westminster over many years on, on UK foreign security policy and uh, greatly regarded in that regard. Uh, and we have, with uh, Sir Malcolm Rifkin and, and, and Lord uh, Brown, uh, we have uh, two very distinguished politicians who have both served as Secretary of State for Scotland uh, and for Defence Secretary, and in, in, the, in Sir Malcolm's case also as Foreign Secretary. So. Really, uh, we have an enormous degree of expertise and knowledge in the panel before us. Each is going to talk uh, for around 10 minutes. Uh, we will then hold it, uh, throw it open to questions and answers from the floor. Uh, and uh, all panelists have agreed that the entire session uh, will be on the record. Uh, so uh, that, uh, I think, will provide some additional fruit for, for any journalist present. That's not the normal procedure at these members' discussions meeting, but given the nature of the subject, uh, our, our panelists have agreed that they're perfectly prepared to have all their remarks uh, on the record. So without further ado, can I please ask Ang Angus Robertson to, to take the floor. <coughs> Angus. Thank you very much. And can I start off uh, with a word of appreciation to Professor Malcolm Chalmers and to Rusi for this uh, timely opportunity to consider the important subject, the security implications of Scottish independence, not potential Scottish independence, but of Scottish independence. 
The title is indeed a broad one, and it invites us to consider implications from a number of perspectives, and I hope to do justice to that, not just from a Scottish perspective, but also considering the rest of the United Kingdom, the wider region, and the international community. This is the first time that the Scottish National Party, Scotland's governing pro-independence party, has been invited to speak to Rusi, so it is appropriate to put today's topic in context. We are now, as Professor Chalmers rightly said, just under 500 days until, away from Scotland's historic independence referendum. On the 18th of September 2014, uh, electors in Scotland will be asked the straightforward question, should Scotland be an independent country? I believe that a majority will vote yes, uh, paving the way for discussions between the Scottish and UK governments between 2014 and 2016, which will lead to a sovereign Scottish state with the power to determine its own foreign defence and security policy. That we've come so far is worthy of comment. In my political lifetime, I can recall people saying, there won't ever be a devolved Scottish Parliament. And then there was. I can recall, recall people saying there'd never ever be an SNP government. And then in 2007, there was. I recall people saying that because of the electoral system, there would never be a majority SNP Scottish government. And then in 2011, there was. Even until recently, there were people who said that there wouldn't be a referendum on Scottish independence. And now there will be one. I would observe that many of those doubters are the very same people who are currently saying that there won't be a majority for independence. It's important to underline that the referendum will take place on the basis of agreement between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. First Minister Alex Salmond and Prime Minister David Cameron signed the Edinburgh Agreement in October 2012, where the governments agreed that the referendum should do the following. It should have a clear legal base. It should be legislated for by the Scottish Parliament. It should be conducted so as to command the confidence of Parliament's governments and people and it should deliver a fair test and a decisive expression of the views of people in Scotland and a result that everyone will respect. The Edinburgh Agreement also includes a key provision on cooperation, uh, that's paragraph 30, where it stresses that, and I quote, the United Kingdom and Scottish governments are committed to working together on matters of mutual interest and to the principles of good communication and mutual respect. The two governments have reached this agreement in that spirit. They look forward to a referendum that is legal and fair, producing a decisive and respected outcome. The two governments are committed to continue to work together constructively in the light of the outcome, whatever it is, in the best interests of the people of Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. I'd like to read out that last line there, because I think it's critical in terms of understanding what the relationship will be between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. The two governments are committed to continue to work together constructively in light of the outcome, whatever it is, in the best interests of the people of Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. If I can briefly outline the roadmap which follows from the Edinburgh Agreement. The Scottish Government is currently preparing its white paper on independence, otherwise known as a prospectus, which will greatly assist in form debate about what is being proposed ahead of the referendum and the basis under which negotiations would follow an affirmative vote between 2014 and 2016. The incoming Scottish Government in 2016 will conduct a strategic defence review to map out the emerging course of policy. That government would, I hope, be led by the Scottish National Party, but it may not be which is why I'm delighted to be joined on the panel by such eminent colleagues from other parties. Hopefully we will hear what priorities we might expect from the other political parties. So far, we have yet heard nothing in that regard. For what it is worth, I think there will be significant cross-party agreement after a yes vote. For my part, I want to outline now the priorities of the Scottish National Party in relation to foreign defence and security policy beyond the objective of the Scottish Parliament and government being responsible for decision-making. These priorities were agreed at the SNP annual conference last year in what was described as the most significant policy update in 30 years and followed detailed consultations and fact-finding visits to our neighbours in Northern Europe and further afield. I quote, An independent Scotland will be an outward-looking nation which is open, fair and tolerant, contributing to peace, justice and equality. By mobilising our assets and the goodwill and recognition that Scotland enjoys in the world, we will provide sustainable access to natural resources to tackle need and prevent insecurity in the world for this and future generations. The SNP reiterates its commitment to non-nuclear defence, international law, the United Nations and supporting multilateral solutions to regional and global challenges. 
While conventional military threats to Scotland are low, it is important to maintain appropriate security and defence arrangements and capabilities. This includes a cyber security and intelligence infrastructure to deal with new threats and protect key national economic and social infrastructure. Scotland is a maritime nation with more than 11,000 miles of coastline, including nearly 800 islands, critical undersea and offshore infrastructure, and an area of responsibility extending far into the North Sea and Atlantic Ocean. The SNP recognises our national responsibilities as a northern European nation to work with our neighbours to fulfil current defence and security responsibilities and improve collective regional arrangements. Environmental changes to the high North and Arctic region raise major regional challenges and responsibilities which Scotland shares. Scotland will, be require, will require military capabilities to fulfil these responsibilities. These will be provided by the Scottish uh, Defence Forces, which will be answerable to the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament. An independent Scottish Government led by the SNP will commit to an annual defence and security budget of £2.5 billion, an annual increase of more than £500 million on recent UK levels of defence spending in Scotland, but nearly £1 billion less than Scottish taxpayers currently contribute to UK defence spending. The updated policy goes on to address the key area of nuclear weapons and multilateral security arrangements. A long-standing national consensus has existed in Scotland uh, that we should not host nuclear weapons, uh, and a sovereign SNP government will negotiate the speediest safe transition of the nuclear fleet from Faz Lane, which will be replaced by conventional naval forces. Security cooperation in our region functions primarily through NATO, which is regarded as the keystone defence organisation by Denmark, Norway, Iceland and the United Kingdom. The SNP wishes Scotland to fulfil its responsibilities to neighbours and allies. On independence, Scotland will inherit its treaty obligations with NATO. An SNP government will maintain NATO membership, subject to an agreement that Scotland will not host nuclear weapons and NATO takes all possible steps to bring about nuclear disarmament as required by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, of which all its members are signatories, and further that NATO continues to respect the right of members to only take part in UN-sanctioned operations. In the absence of such an agreement, Scotland will work with NATO as a member of the Partnership for Peace programme like Sweden, Finland, Austria and Ireland. Scotland will be a full member of the Common Security and Defence Policy of the European Union and the Organisation for Cooperation and Security in Europe. Given these commitments and further details in the policy on capabilities basing defence industry procurement and with a repeated stress on cooperation, uh, how should we understand the title of today's talk, the security implications of Scottish independence in the broader sense and looking into the decades ahead, not just issues of is this a good thing now, is this a bad thing. How does it look uh, when considering the decades ahead? For Scotland, foreign defence and secur security policy will always be determined in line with the priorities of the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish electorate in contrast to today. We will have the opportunity to maintain the optimal defence forces protecting our military infrastructure and traditions. Our most important partner will be the rest of the United Kingdom, based on mutual respect and the opportunity for closest conventional defence and security cooperation. Scotland will strongly focus on domestic and regional security obligations, as well as the ability to contribute to the international community. For the rest of the United Kingdom, I believe that Scotland will be a key neighbour and ally Given the strategic considerations of living on the same island, it will be in the interest of the Westminster government to ensure the best possible relationships. And that includes military coordination, planning, training, intelligence and procurement. Whitehall will expect that Scotland is adequately managing security matters in northern Britain. For the wider region, neighbouring nations such as Denmark, Norway and Iceland will want a sovereign Scotland to take our collective challenges seriously and be a reliable and capable partner. This will include key joint maritime and air patrolling uh, responsibilities within a NATO context. Closer defence and security cooperation includes NORDEFCO, which aims to strengthen member countries' defence capabilities by identifying areas for cooperation and to promote effective solutions. There's a European Union dimension in this area, which includes the Nordic Battle Group. For treaty organisations such as NATO and the European Union, Will Scotland be a proactive and positive partner? Absolutely. We regularly hear from the UK government about the valuable role played by nations such as Norway and Denmark. These are, of course, countries who share the same perspectives 
as majority Scottish public opinion on nuclear weapons? Will Scotland be a trusted strategic partner fulfilling its responsibilities just as other conventionally armed member states do? Yes, it will. In a wider security sense, what can and will Scotland offer? Scotland is well placed to support the United Nations and EU peacekeeping operations. And there's a tremendous scalable research and development potential relating to cyber security. And there's also an ambition to become a key hosting area for peace and reconciliation. It's in the interests of Scotland and it's in the interests of the rest of the United Kingdom to take the security dimension seriously now, which is why it's irresponsible for the UK government to refuse technical discussions ahead of the referendum with the Scottish government. It's also misguided for the UK Ministry of Defence to increasingly refuse to answer parliamentary questions which would be beneficial to the process of understanding ahead of the 2014 vote. I note that Prime Minister David Cameron wants discussions about a reformed European Union with Brussels before holding an in-out EU referendum. The security implications of Scottish independence are important domestically, including the, all of the home nations and internationally. It's my view that it is right for national governments, national parliaments and national electorates to determine their foreign defence and security priorities. I look forward to Scotland being able to do this shortly. And I conclude by thanking Rusi for hosting today's event and look forward to hearing from the, the contribution of my fellow panellists and questions from the audience. Thank you very much. That was great. Perfect. Sir Martin. Uh, Chairman, uh, thank you very much indeed for the extremely kind remarks you made about all four members of the panel as being extremely distinguished. Uh, after those comments, I can't help but look forward to hearing what I have to say. <laughs> I would like to begin by emphasizing how intensely relevant it is to be looking at security and defense uh, implications of an independent Scotland at this moment in time. Because it's worth just remembering that one of the fundamental reasons why the Act of Union came into effect in 1707 was precisely an area of security that we share a small island, and therefore the security, the safety, the future of any part of that island, it must be intensely more reliable if we have a common defense, not just friendly relations, but a common defense policy, a common political identity, and an ability to use our combined armed forces for the security of these islands. And this is not just a hypothetical matter. Just reflect for a moment the Second World War, when Southern Ireland, unlike during the First World War, had become an independent state. And one of the decisions of that Irish government was to deny the Royal Navy the use of the naval bases in the south of Ireland that had been available to it during the whole of the First World War. And remember how important the Atlantic uh, convoys were to the survival of the United Kingdom uh, during that extraordinary period. Now, I'm not suggesting that a Scottish government of an independent state would necessarily be hostile or different, but what I am saying is that the whole point of independence, if it is to be seen as valid and desirable, is that they have the right and the power to carry out a different foreign policy and a different defense policy, and it must therefore follow from that that in the event of the rest of the United Kingdom being involved in conflict, the Scottish government would at least have the right to refuse to be involved in it or to allow their coastline or their territory to be used for any purpose associated with it. So these aren't just hypothetical matters. We could have lost the Atlantic campaign. We could have lost the Second World War as a result of that decision by the Irish government. Fortunately, it was not uh, to be, but that was no thanks to the decision taken in Dublin. So that is, I think, a good starting point. Then let us look at the particular policies, because Angus gave us a very good general presentation of where they stand. But, you know, it's incredible how little work has been done on the practical issues that would need to be addressed. Take, for example, their desire to join NATO. Now, for the last 30 years, they have been totally against membership of NATO for independent Scotland. And I welcome the fact that they now managed by a whisker to persuade their party conference to change the view on that. But we had today... Angus saying that 
uh, an independent Scotland would inherit the right to be a member of NATO. No, it wouldn't. Any more than they inherit the right to be a member of the European Union. They've had to acknowledge that would be uh, an application they would have to be making for membership, and it would be up to the other member states as to whether an independent Scotland was admitted to Europe, even more so in the case of NATO because we'd have the extraordinary situation of the government of a newly independent Scottish state saying we would like to apply to become a member of the NATO alliance, or incidentally, our other most fundamental policy is to expel the nuclear deterrent from Scotland and require the rest of the United Kingdom to take it away. Now, can we please be a member? Nuclear weapons are not incidental to the NATO alliance, as everyone in this room <coughs> will clearly know. They are a fundamental part of the defense strategy of NATO. And it's not just American nuclear weapons that are part of that strategy. The United Kingdom's nuclear weapons are committed to NATO, and they are part of the policy of NATO. And I was interested that uh, Angus in his remarks said that the priority for a Scottish government after independence would be to negotiate the speediest departure of Trident from Faz Lane. Well, what did he mean by speediest? A few weeks, a few months, one or two years, 10 years, 15, 20, 30 years? And would Trident be allowed to remain until some alternative arrangements had been made? Because anyone who knows the faintest thing about nuclear weapons knows that if Trident was required to be removed from Scotland, even if the United Kingdom government wished to be as helpful and as constructive and as friendly and as well disposed as it no doubt would wish to be, have they given the slightest thought as to what would be required? It would take months, if not years, to find an alternative site. Look how long it's taken to find sites for nuclear waste, infinitely less controversial than where you were going to place nuclear uh, submarines. You'd then have to get planning permission with all that, that involved. You'd have to go through all the health and safety requirements. And you'd then have to do the construction work required. This is always assuming there are sites with the geographical properties that the Faslane site has and Coolport have and, and so forth. So we are, must be talking, I can't give an exact figure any more than anybody else, but it's not unrealistic to assume that would take, with the best will in the world, 10 to 15 years before the actual construction of an alternative site could be completed. And are the nationalists willing to give a commitment that however long it took, Trident would remain in Scotland until then, and if they are, why haven't they said so publicly and said don't expect any speedy departure from Trident from Scotland, uh, it would be years, if not a generation, even if everyone was friendly and disposed. And if they were to expel Trident, it goes without saying, they would hardly be a strong member of NATO. Think also of an area I have particular involvement at the moment, as does uh, Ming Campbell, the, on the intelligence and security side. Now, of course, uh, Angus made a passing reference to cyber security and intelligence. But again, is there any homework being done as to what that would involve? The current budget of the intelligence agencies, MI6, MI5, GCHQ, which operate throughout the United Kingdom, is some £2 billion a year. Even 10% of that is £200 million, and that's just for the running costs. That doesn't include the actual establishment of such institutions. The training of the individuals, it, you know, at the moment, uh, the Scotland's uh, protection from terrorist attack, and that's not hypothetical because Glasgow, of course, was subject to a potential terrorist attack, Glasgow Airport. Scotland's protection from terrorist attack, like England, like Wales, is based to a significant degree on the extraordinary performance of the intelligence agencies. Is a future Scotland going to be dependent simply on the hope that MI6, MI5, GCHQ would share intelligence with them? They probably would. But what's supposed to be the great advantage from a Scottish point of view of turning what is at the moment an absolute entitlement to something based on hoped goodwill? And has the Scottish National Party identified the 200 or 300 or 400 million that would be required to even begin to replicate uh, what already exists in uh, Scotland. And the final point I want to refer to is, of course, the armed forces, which were hardly mentioned. And when the nationalists drew up their original proposals, I don't know if they've revised them since, what was appalling was not what they were proposing, it's what they seemed to fail to understand. There were two fundamental flaws. On the day their announcement was launched, they said, of course, it would be relatively straightforward because we already have all these Scottish regiments. You know, the Royal Regiment of Scotland and the Scots Guards and uh, the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, they could just you know, become part of, they would be part of the core Scottish Army. And then it was pointed out to them by the regiments, actually, 
we are part of the British Army, thank you very much. We will continue part of the British Army unless we decide, or unless it is decided by others, that we should move elsewhere. And of course, as anyone again in this room will understand, probably three quarters of the people, the soldiers who serve in these regiments, don't live in Scotland. They may be called MacDonald or Mackenzie or Gordon, but they've joined these regiments because of perhaps a generation or two generations ago, uh, their families moved south from Scotland and they wanted to identify with Scottish regiments. <coughs> so that was one fundamental extraordinary flaw, but there was a second even more serious, even more that serious, but even more serious. They made no allowance for the fact that what they were talking about with their 15,000 and with their uh, proposed budget was the teeth of an army with the combat forces. When asked, they had nothing to say at all of any work they had done with regard to logistics, supply, medical facilities, intelligence corps, all the whole structure, which as anyone will know, in this room at any rate, if not in SMP headquarters, is two-thirds of, of a modern army, are not combat forces. So the numbers have to take that into account. And if the 15,000 he's talking about do take that into account, <laughs> that means the combat forces are hardly more than 5,000. And is that really going to be uh, uh, something we should uh, enth enthusiastically look forward to as being something that would enhance Scotland's position in the world? So this is back of an envelope stuff. They haven't begun to do their homework. And if they wait, I, I don't mention all the other areas of currency and EU and all that sort of stuff, but I simply conclude by saying, if they want to be taken seriously, it is no use just giving a few headlines and a few figures worked out, no doubt in the space of an hour and a half, <coughs> without understanding, without talking to the armed forces or to anyone, right? retired generals, even if you can't be permitted to speak to serving ones, as to what are the consequences that would have to flow. So it's not surprising that the polls at the moment show overwhelmingly a rejection of independence north of the border. And I believe that as these issues get more and more ventilated over the next 12 months, unless the nationalists do their homework, unless they give commitments, figures, policies that show they understand never mind agree with, understand what defense, security, and intelligence require, then they will not only lose heavily, but they will thoroughly deserve to as well. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Ming. Uh, there's a joke which is current in the Democratic Party of the United States, which is why is it that the convention to choose the candidate for the presidency takes four days when two days would be enough? To which the reply is, well, after two days, everything's been said, but not everyone said it. <laughs> and that, uh, I think, allows me uh, <laughs> to adopt brevitatis causa, as lawyers say, everything that's just been said by Malcolm Rifkin. But to counsel those of you who may spend time in Scotland between now and the date of the referendum, uh, that so far as we know, GPs have not yet found a cure for referendum fatigue. This has been one of the longest campaigns of its kind. Um, I don't speak for the Liberal Democrats, but I speak as a Liberal Democrat. And I speak as someone whose constituency, the Black Watch, recruit. I speak as someone who has RAF Lucas in his constituency shortly to be turned from the use of the Royal Air Force uh, into use by the Army. And I speak as someone who's a member for a county, if those still exist, which contains Forsyth. So defense not only has a strategic value for me, it has a constituency value as well. Uh, we were asked by Angus Robertson perfectly fairly he said, what are your priorities? I'll tell you what my priority is. My priority is the maintenance of a union which has served all of the countries of the United Kingdom for 300 years, and in particular for the maintenance of armed forces who throughout that period have buttressed and supported that union. 34 billion plus uh, a year plus 2 billion on intelligence. Our defense budget is the fourth largest in the world. And in my view, to remove the Scottish contribution uh, either to that budget or indeed in terms of manpower, installations, and expertise 
would severely damage the overall defense effort of the United Kingdom. Let me turn, if I may, briefly to the question of NATO. That security that I've described has very largely, in the post-1945 world, been secured through NATO. I invite you, if you haven't done it recently, to go and to read the most recent expression of the strategic concept of NATO. It says that NATO will pursue policies of deterrence by both conventional and nuclear means. It does seem to me a little strange that a party which describes nuclear weapons uh, in apocalyptic terms, describes them as being abhorrent, would wish to ally itself uh, or join uh, an alliance with that as its mission statement. And I thought there was one quite revealing feature of uh, Angus Robertson's presentation when he started to talk about Partnership for Peace, P4P as it's known. Remember, P4P is not for members of NATO. P4P is for people who are outside NATO. Uh, so there appears to be, at least on the face of it, uh, to be an inherent contradiction. Now, I've said to you already uh, that uh, defense has domestic implications uh, for me. And I think the notion that defense is somehow just Scottish bases, Scottish units, and Scottish installations is one which does not stand scrutiny because the influence of Scotland down the years, down the ages, in the British Army has been profound. Uh, the Duke of Wellington ha may well have said, as he saw the Scottish regiments lining up at Waterloo, by God, I don't know what they do to the French, but they certainly frighten me. Uh, but the fact is the Scottish contribution has often, in terms of quality and sometimes quantity, been far above the 8 or 10 percent which is now being suggested. And it's not simply a question uh, of transferring, uh, as if on a balance sheet, uh, the assets of defence in Scotland and assuming that what comes out of that will be entirely appropriate and apt. But the one thing we didn't hear, uh, and of course, uh, the more perceptive of you, I think, may, may well have begun to uh, take issue with me on that topic, and that is what kind of defense? These general expressions uh, of support, uh, of cooperation, what do they actually amount to? What could they amount to? And Malcolm Rifkin quite rightly mentioned the lack of detail. I've written down some areas in which there's no detail. Engineers, Artillery, helicopters, medical, particularly medical of the kind we see in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital uh, and at Headley Court. Procurement, support, training, human resources, financial management. Where are these to be found within the 2.5 billion pounds? And what possible economies of scale can there be in the provision of all of these necessary parts of a defence profile if you are p p persuaded or determined to do so on a Scotland-only basis. Let me turn, if I may, to Faz Lane, which is already featured. It's not just Faz Lane. It's Coolport as well, where the missiles uh, and the warheads are stored. How long does it take to break up, because that's essentially what's being asked, a facility of that kind? Is this something which can be accomplished in a matter of two years? Scottish Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament has issued a document saying all of this could be done within two years. Frankly, I don't believe it. And what about the jobs? Are they important or unimportant? Some 6,500 jobs at Faz Lane and Coolport, uh, a base to which it's expected without independence. The entire submarine fleet of the United Kingdom will shortly be uh, moved, to which it will be moved. What about those? Are those important? Are those skills important? We're in the course of producing two aircraft carriers. A large part of their construction has been based on Scottish yards, uh, both on the Clyde and more particularly in Rosyth, at least as far as I'm concerned. Were we in Scotland to be independent of the rest of the United Kingdom, 
would the rest of the United Kingdom feel compelled to offer those shipbuilding <coughs> opportunities to an independent country? Cooperation is one thing, but cooperation always will depend upon interests. And I can already hear the shouts of uh, English members of parliament uh, were there to be independence and a Whitehall-based Ministry of Defence were to say, well, by the way, we're going to have the Type 45 built on the Clyde. I tell you, you wouldn't get very far with that in the House of Commons. And also the point which Malcolm Rifkin made too about opportunities. Why do people, why do Scots join our armed services? They join them because of the opportunity that's provided. All right, how many commands, naval, military, air force, would be available to people of ambition in an independent Scotland? How many Scots who wanted to take up a military career would be satisfied with the kind of profile which is being discussed? And what if a large proportion of these Scots wanted to serve abroad? Would they be permitted to? Would an independent Scotland be willing to allow them to serve abroad, for example, in operations where the issue of nuclear deterrence became, became a live concern? The mere fact of asking these questions, in my view, simply underlines the f uh, fundamental conclusion that the slogan, better together, isn't just a convenient way of describing how the United Kingdom should operate, but it's a very convenient way of demonstrating that for theoretical, emotional, and pragmatic reasons, the best possible outcome for Scotland in the realm of defence is for us to remain a part of the United Kingdom. Lord Brown, please. Thank you, Malcolm. This is slightly imbalanced, I think. <laughs> I'm conscious that uh, there are three unionists with small U politicians on this panel um, and one uh, nationalist. Uh, I have to say, uh, Angus is a robust and engaging politician and he's well able to um, sustain his corner, but uh, my sense is that the audience will only have so much patience for hearing the same argument put so many times, so I will try to approach this from a slightly different perspective, um, accepting all of the points made by uh, Sir Ming and Sir Malcolm. First of all, thank you very much to Rusi and to Professor Chalmers for arranging this opportunity. There are too few opportunities, I think, for the people of Scotland to get access to the information that they need to make these difficult decisions and it's welcome that this is being done. It's a pity to a degree that it's being done in London and not being done in Scotland, but no doubt we will all get an opportunity to um, engage in these issues um, from, uh, from our individual perspectives. I should say that uh, I think uh, like the rest of my colleagues, I was represented as being the Labour Party's spokesman uh, on this issue. I am not. I mean, I think most of you know who the Labour Party spokesman is um, on these issues, but I'm not, but I'm a member of the Labour Party. Can, can, I, can I start off by saying, um, I, I mean, I recognise, and at least there is an honesty to what Angus says, that you cannot engage with these issues about the proper defence and security strategy for Scotland until you know what its foreign and security policy is. And... and um, He's right to suggest that any country must start this process with some form of strategic defence and security analysis. But, but until you know what a country's position in the world is, or its position in, in relation to the challenges and threats that it faces are, and until they are properly assessed, then you cannot move on um, to describe a proper defence and security strategy. You cannot outline it. So the first challenge that Scotland will face, and the first implication of this is... That if that's to be done for Scotland alone, then there needs to be the capacity in Scotland to do that. And that has to be created because it doesn't presently exist. Now, I'm not one of those that say Scotland cannot do things. Of course it can. 
But you need to find the resources to be able to do anything that it wants to do. And those resource challenges have implications and they have implications for existing capability and capacity and implications for where you put your resources otherwise. So that's the first significant implication for Scotland about this debate. And part of the reason why, with respect to Angus, it has to be so general about that strategy and about the capabilities that will be needed to deliver it is because that work has not yet been done. Because it cannot be done in Scotland because the capability doesn't exist to do it. And that's not cheap. I mean, if you look around this city, um, at the capacity there is in government and beyond government to do that, that's a very expensive commodity. The second point I would make is that to some degree he did put some framework on his own party's positions. I have to say as I watch the body language of experts, genuine experts in the audience whom I know, it suggested to me that this shopping list that he was coming out with in terms of Scotland's position was generating a challenge for resources that went well beyond the figure of £2.5 billion pound that concluded it. Now, I don't know where this £2.5 billion pound comes from. Is it 2% or 2.7% of the disaggregated part of, of the GDP uh, that, that belongs to Scotland? Or where does it come from? But you can't start deciding how to keep a country secure and how to defend it by, first of all, putting a bill on it and saying, we will do it from there. Now, governments, of course, here sometimes do that. But it's not very successful. But it's not very successful. If you're going to do it successfully, and if you're starting from scratch, as largely Scotland would be in this analysis, then you have to do it properly. The second point I want to make is that all parts of the United Kingdom gain from the provision of security and defence on a UK-wide basis. I mean, whatever the motivation in 1707 for the Union was in relation to defence, that's certainly the case now. And we should not devalue what we have, despite the fact that we always argue for more and better, and we're critical in terms of being parties of government of each other's provision of this. Never mind the high level figures of percentage that we spend on defense, never mind the capabilities that we can describe. The fact of the matter is that we in these islands, because we approach this with a shared responsibility enjoy a very high level of protection and security. And I have in this area two priorities. One is to preserve the union, but the other is to preserve consistently that high level of protection and security that the people of these islands enjoy. And we should not give any of that away, even for a comparatively short period of time easily, because it's an extremely risky thing to do. And we do enjoy that for a number of reasons, most of which have got to do with the fact that we do it across these islands and in partnership internationally on the basis of agreements, relationships, partnerships that we have built up over centuries and decades. We have, for example, and each of these elements of this generate a challenge and a serious implication for the defense of an independent country should we break the union up. I mean, we have, for example, a very sophisticated, world-class command and control structure in the United Kingdom. Whether Scotland can disaggregate parts of our armed forces and say they belong to Scotland or Scotland could negotiate them, it will have to create a Ministry of Defense and a command and control structure because it doesn't exist. It will also, of course, have to create an intelligence infrastructure too, and whether that is complementary to the United Kingdom and it would be in the interest of the rest of the United Kingdom to share intelligence with Scotland as we concede, but it will have to be sharing it with some piece of infrastructure. This is an extraordinarily expensive series of things to do. Now, it may just be possible, and I haven't worked this out, if you give up on other capabilities to run that command and control, that Ministry of Defence, that intelligence network from a substantial part of a budget of £2.5 billion, pounds, but it won't leave you very much. We enjoy also 
a very sophisticated and effective aggregate defence capabilities. Again, these may not be all that all of our armed forces would want, and the people will always argue for more and better, but they are world class. Replicating them for Scotland against the series of challenges that the Scottish National Party have, never mind those challenges that other parties and others may have for Scotland in this other environment, is going to be an extremely expensive thing to do. Professor Malcolm Chalmers has done some work, which uh, I'm sure many of you will have read, that suggests that in fact Scotland would not be able to afford some of the capabilities that the Scottish National Party say that we would need for its maritime patrols and defence, for example. We enjoy enormous economies of scale because we operate across the United Kingdom, which will be lost. Never mind the single United Armed Forces and their history, which my colleagues have already spoken to, and other supporting organisations that exist. We enjoy a very significant infrastructure and we enjoy a significant degree of global influence that Scotland would be, have to be prepared to give up on. And we enjoy this influence because we have this network of relationship and alliances, not the least of which is NATO. Now, I understand entirely why the Scottish National Party, after 30 years of opposition to NATO, decided that they needed to change their policy. Because there was no credible defence for Scotland out with some alliance. Their first preference was some form of Northern European alliance. But, of course, when they discovered that almost all, if not all, of those Northern European countries that they wanted to go into a separate alliance with were all members of NATO, then they had to enjoy NATO, and of course the security guarantee of NATO was significantly important to Scotland. But for many of the reasons that have already been identified, they haven't worked out what this means for their extended other policy or for the people of Scotland. I mean, NATO is a nuclear armed alliance. Never mind the details of any of its documentation. It is a nuclear armed alliance. We're constantly being told, and no doubt this fact would have been deployed if the argument had only been about nuclear weapons, that only three of the countries in the alliance have nuclear weapons. But as a matter of fact, eight of them have nuclear weapons on their soil. There are US, NATO nuclear weapons in five other countries. And those of you who followed the defense and deterrence posture of you will be aware that there are at least five, if not more, other countries who would have welcomed those weapons onto their soil if they could have had them, if in the enlargement of NATO we hadn't given a promise that they wouldn't be there. So more than half of these countries are actively supportive of nuclear weapons. And all of them came out of the defence and deterrence posture of you in a consensus that the United States should be encouraged to keep their tactical nuclear weapons based in Europe. These must all now be things that the SNP are contemplating, agreeing to, should they be in government and in independent Scotland. In short, they would sign up to a consensus that US nuclear weapons should be based in Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Turkey. I've forgotten the fifth one. Belgium, and Belgium. But the nuclear weapons of the United Kingdom have to be removed from Scotland. This seems to be disproportionately contradictory in terms of, 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 of their policy. I have to say while I'm passing, I mean, I, I know that uh, Angus and the SNP constantly make the point that the people of Scotland in the vast majority wish these weapons removed from Scotland, but um, I don't know how many of you saw the most recent polling conducted by Lord Ashcroft in which a slightly different question was asked of the people of Scotland, which showed that over 50% of the people in Scotland were comfortable to keep the weapons, some of them in qualified positions, but so I'm not sure that that's entirely the position of the people of Scotland. Let me just in closing say that it is the people of Scotland, the economy of Scotland, the infrastructure of Scotland, and the way of life of Scotland that needs to be secured and defended. It is presently secured and defended 
who are world-class and very high level. And if we cannot transition from where we are to an independence securing all of those things and not becoming a gateway for some of those attacks on these islands, then we should not take this risk. And at the very least, even if the people of Scotland were prepared to pay the cost of replicating this security, which would be substantially more than the price that the National Party have put on it, this is not a transition that the people of Scotland would want us to go through. And I think that they will respond um, in the way that is sensible for the security and defence when it comes to the referendum by keeping us in, in the United Kingdom. Well, first of all, can I thank all our panellists for keeping to time, which mean, which um, is most impressive indeed and, and shows the, the experience they all have uh, in this business. It, that means we have rather more than half an hour uh, for Q&A and discussion. And I'd like to, since uh, three of our panelists did address quite a number of questions uh, to Angus and, and conscious of Lord Brown's uh, point about there being something of an imbalance in this, but also because what many of us would like to hear is rather more of, in terms of the, the detail of what in this area independence would mean to just perhaps transmit a couple of the, the questions that panelists uh, have asked uh, to Angus and give him a chance to, to respond. First of all, there were a number of questions asked in relation to the nuclear area, particularly perhaps the question about what speediest means in terms of, of timetable for departure of nuclear weapons from Scottish soil, uh, but also the issue of whether, in your view, uh, the SNP's policy for an independent Scotland is compatible with NATO's strategic concept. Uh, and then on the conventional side, quite a number of, I think all three of our unionist speakers uh, <coughs> talked about um, the 2.5 billion defense and security budget. And in particular, I think one of the strongest themes was whether that would cover what they argued was a significant capital cost involved in setting up uh, an independent Scottish defense force, but also all the many things that that defence and security budget would cover, not least the, the security side of the equation. So if you have any comments you'd like to make in terms of, of whether you think uh, that that budget would be enough to cover uh, what people would expect the Scottish Defence Force and indeed Intelligence Service to cover. Please, Angus. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, Lord Brown, for being gracious and acknowledging it's one against three on the, uh, uh, on the platform. Can I, can I start off by saying that um, by wishing Scotland to be a sovereign state and being able to make democratic decisions uh, about foreign policy, defense, and security in no way diminishes a recognition of the value uh, and history and contribution that people have made on the issue of defense in a UK uh, context. Um, uh, Malcolm Rifkin started off by talking about uh, the situation of Ireland in the Second World War, uh, which was entirely accurate. Uh, did not, however, then go on to make mention of the contribution of Australia, of Canada, of New Zealand, other parts of uh, the empire, now Commonwealth, that in their own rights as self-determining nations uh, in terms of working shoulder to shoulder with the UK in fighting fascism played. Uh, so I think, first off, I think it's important to report both sides of the, the, the balance sheet. And as I repeatedly pointed out, uh, our aim is that Scotland should be able to determine foreign policy, defence and security in line with the wishes of the public in Scotland. Um, and more often than not, that will chime entirely with the, the, right, uh, the, rest, of the, uh, the rest of the UK. Um, why does one want to make different decisions on defense and security? And Malcolm Rifkin was quite right in beginning by pointing out that it is occasionally the case that one feels one must make different decisions. So is there any evidence that the people of Scotland would wish to make decisions differently 
and are those differences accommodated within the UK? Does the UK Parliament sit and listen and consider when, for example, it is pointed out that notwithstanding one poll commissioned by Lord Ashcroft, every other poll, as far as I'm aware, that has been taken by any reputable polling company in Scottish political history has pointed out that an overwhelming majority of people do not want to have nuclear weapons based in Scotland. Now, if the United Kingdom uh, and its political institutions is so representative of the views of all of the nations and regions of the UK, surely that would be taken cognizance of. It's not just public opinion, it's our public institutions, every one uh, of our churches, the third sector. Uh, the list is long and august. It might not be reflected by the realities in which many of the people in this room think about defence matters, but in Scotland, there is as close to a political settled will that we do not want to have nuclear weapons uh, in our country. And perhaps that's why so often the discussion uh, heads in that direction when we have these sort of uh, discussions. Uh, is it consistent within, uh, to work within NATO as a country that does not want to have nuclear weapons uh, on its soil? Absolutely. That is the express position of the government of Norway and of the government of Denmark. If it's such a problem, then NATO no doubt would have taken up the issue with the government of Norway and the government of Denmark, but it has not. I would also point out uh, that I cannot imagine that the government of the rest of the UK, believing as it does in deterrence theory and the use of, uh, the, um, uh, of the Trident uh, system, that they would wish it to be based ad infinitum in a sovereign Scotland where that government would rather not uh, have it there. Of course, this is a matter of negotiation, so uh, forgive me, uh, Malcolm, but I won't be drawn on timescale. We will be negotiating for the speediest safe uh, transfer of uh, nuclear submarines from Scotland. Uh, on the issue of budget, we can't have command and control, we can't have this, we can't have that, we're going to be too weary and too incapable of doing a whole series of, of, of things. That is the impression that has been left. Um, uh, what country might we have a look at to compare what one can do with a budget of roughly two and a half billion uh, sterling in defence and security terms? I invite you to have a look at the uh, defence budget of the Kingdom of Denmark, a nation also with just over five million uh, population. Uh, their 2012 defence budget uh, amounted to 23.2 billion krona, that is 2.6 billion sterling. They operate uh, an air force with 93 aircraft, including F-16s and maritime patrol aircraft. I just note that the UK has no fixed-wing maritime patrol capability whatsoever. Uh, they operate a navy with 12 larger vessels, so the larger vessels alone is more than the UK has stationed in Scotland, and I could go on. Uh, we have UK prime ministers who regularly get up in the House of Commons and stress the amazing contribution that we have from our uh, smaller neighbours um, I note that between them, the air forces of Norway and Denmark dropped as much ordnance on Libya as the UK Royal Air Force did. It is possible, if one wishes to, uh, to organise one's armed forces in such a way that they can play the appropriate part. I have to say, uh, one uh, minor disappointment hearing my august colleagues is that what I didn't hear was a single word about what their perspectives would be if Scotland were independent. Of course, we heard a very interesting uh, debate about why Scotland shouldn't be independent, but I heard nothing about what perspective the Liberal Democrats or the Labour Party, or I know there's not many Conservatives in, in Scotland, um, but um, it, it would be good to hear the perspectives of other political parties about what they would wish. I understand that they don't want independence. I still argue about what I think the UK should be doing uh, before Scotland becomes independence. And I, I, if we're not going to hear it here, I hope that we're going to, I hope we're going to uh, hear it uh, soon. I don't want to take, take up too much time, but that covers the, the two areas that you asked me to, to, to cover, Malcolm. Uh, what is the basis of this? It is that a nation should be able to decide, in essence, does it send its young men and women to war or not? Key question. Iraq, no thank you. Scottish service personnel were sent into a conflict that most people in Scotland, I have to say in plenty of other places besides, thought was illegal. But our service personnel were sent there nonetheless. 
That doesn't happen in normal countries. Your service personnel are sent into conflict if your government wishes it. That is what I would wish Scotland to be, a normal country that can decide about what it doesn't take part in, but also what it does. The biggest gen genocide since the Second World War took place in Darfur, and there wasn't a single British serviceman or woman anywhere close to the peacekeeping mission that took part in that. I would wish Scotland had taken part uh, in that. So it's about the choices of what does one take part in, what does one not take part in, uh, and that is the basis of a democratic decision. And if the UK was the optimal decision uh, making vehicle for Scotland's democracy, we would have listened a long time ago to the fact that we don't want nuclear weapons in our country. Great. Thank you very much, Angus. Who, let's see some. We've got a, a, a quite a number of hands already going up. The, the lady here in, in the blue, please. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Jill Hunter. I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank you very much to all panellists today for such an interesting um, uh, interesting presentations. Um, my question is for Mr Robertson, please. Um, Mr Robertson, it has an, an EU angle. Um, in a situation where Scotland was renegotiating membership into the EU, would the Scottish Government seek to opt out of the Schengen Agreement, and as an EU expert, I'm not sure if that's even negotiable for new member states. If it's not, have you considered um, the wider implications of what that would mean? Thank you. I'm going, I'm, if I may, I'll take a number of, of, of questions first, because we've got quite a lot of people. Gentlemen in the front row now. If I could just ask, extending your... Could the questioners use the microphones, please? Yeah, Thank just you. asked uh, re regarding your nuclear policy, is it your aim to make the Scot Scottish territorial waters a nuclear-free zone and restrict the movement of other NATO uh, elements. Lord West. Uh, yes, Admiral Lord West. Um, I think what's very clear is if Scotland uh, separated, that it would diminish us all, and there's no doubt whatsoever, it is a clear fact, that defence of these islands would be weakened. My question relates to the budget. I think the 2.5 billion, I'm not quite sure where it comes from, all of the sums I've done, I've done quite complicated work, made it look like more like 1.8, but Angus is committing now, should they separate to 2.5 billion the first year, I imagine, which is uh, interesting. Um, but of that money, presumably about 800, 800 million would be procurement money. Um, at the moment, in procurement terms in the UK, we spend about 18 billion. Firms follow where the money is. Inevitably, there is going to be a huge impact on firms that are actually building defense equipments and security equipments and I'd just be interested in views of the panel on that. Right. Uh, other, a gentleman near the back here. Yes, please. Uh, Brigadier Will Sarri from Australia. Um, arguably, the Five Eyes uh, arrangement is perhaps the uh, strongest intelligence and information sharing uh, network the world has. Uh, where does Scotland see itself if it or when it gets its independence? Does it see it creating a six eyes arrangement and how would it get into it? Right. Um, what I'm going to do now for those questions is ask Angus to start us off and then we'll ask all our other panellists whether they, they wish to. Not all the questions are only to Angus, I think. So we'll, we'll get everybody to have their say. Please, Angus. And um, brevity, no doubt, given the, the time scale, is also, a, is also a target. So first off, on Scot Scottish negotiations with the European Union, can I start off by pointing out an important aspect to the, this whole issue of transition, which is more often than not overlooked, uh, which is, uh, bearing in mind the referendum takes place uh, in September 2014, that Scotland remains within the United Kingdom uh, until the elections to the next Scottish Parliament, which is 2016. And it is during that time that the aim of the Scottish Government is to complete the most important multilateral and bilateral political arrangements. Of course, there will be transition matters which, which go beyond that period, but political agreement around that, that timescale. Um, a timescale, I note that when the UK Government's legal advisor was on the Today programme, he said that he was in agreement that the 18-month timescale was reasonable. Uh, I also think that that is a reasonable timescale, and the question that you ask is one of those that would, um, uh, would be part of the discussions at that stage. Uh, would Scotland wish to be part of Schengen? Uh, no. Um, uh, Scotland wants to remain with the same uh, travel area arrangements that include the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. Um, point two, territorial waters. 
uh, Scotland would work within the ambit of, of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, that allows for the uh, right of passage of all vessels. I hope that answers your question. Um, Scotland becoming a sovereign state will diminish us all uh, with the greatest respect. Lord West, that's a, of course a perfectly reasonable point of view to have. I disagree. Uh, I think a normal country in a normal democracy makes decisions as to whether it sends its men and women to, to war or not. I think a parliament... Uh, a nation, a society that is able to make those decisions is certainly not diminishing itself. It is um, becoming a normal nation. Um, that, that we are committing now to £2.5 billion. pounds. will observe as the Scottish politics will know that that was decided on last year at the SNP conference after a very, very long uh, debate. Absolutely right to uh, point out that nearly a third of the UK of most defence budgets are uh, procurement. Here's another aspect of the debate that I hear very little of, um, um, particularly in, in Westminster, uh, which is an acknowledgement that a very significant part of the contribution by Scottish taxpayers to the MOD in procurement terms is not spent in Scotland. So it's actually less spent on procurement in Scotland than taxpayers contribute to the MOD and the defence statistics. Uh, Lord West, bear that out. Just one small example of that, using the MOD's own statistics in terms of SME uh, and de defence procurement, only 2%, use the MOD's own statistics, only 2% uh, of defence procurement goes to SMEs in Scotland. Our population share is 8.4%. Um, there will be more spent on defence procurement in Scotland than there has been in the United Kingdom, absolutely. And here's why that's quite important. Here's why that's quite important. Because a significant amount, a significant part of that spending is spent in the rest of the United Kingdom, which is why when people say, oh, this won't be built in Scotland, that won't be built in Scotland, quite apart from being tremendously childish, that one wouldn't actually want to make the best decisions about where to build things on the basis of, is it the highest quality? Does it perform the function that it should? It's also, if one is ordering military um, uh, materiel from neighboring countries between one another, it, it does seem to be a good idea to actually do so on a co collaborative basis when one cooperates as neighbors, and that's very much what I look forward to doing. Will Scotland continue to buy many um, important defense procurement items from the rest of the United Kingdom? Absolutely, and will it work the other way around? Absolutely. On uh, information and intelligence sharing, sorry, I know I've been speaking quite long, um, uh, is it right for us to wish uh, to share intelligence at the highest level? Absolutely. We would um, be the only um, neighbouring nation with a, a land border. Uh, if it's possible to have appropriate relationships with Australia, um, I seem to remember some people in your nation be described as separatists for wishing to make decisions for yourself. Um, the UK currently has... Well, we're on public record here, so I won't go into tremendous detail, but people here will understand the arrangements that exist uh, with G2 in the, in the Irish Republic. People will understand uh, the intelligence sharing that goes on uh, in relation to MPA with New Zealand. Is it possible to work when it's in your interest to share intelligence where that is important to your citizens in neighboring countries? Please, of course it is. Of course it is. Right, I'm now going to bring our other three panels in. Uh, Angus is raise another set of really interesting issues. So I'm going to start with Des uh, and then come to Ming and then to Malcolm uh, to add any other points they want to make uh, relatively briefly. Des, please. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I <coughs> all of these questions interest me and I noticed, I don't think the Schengen question was answered, but I think the Schengen question is key to a series of challenges in relation to security and maybe I shouldn't answer it for the SNP, but but it does have key implications for security. Um, the, 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 the intelligence question, I, I mean, there are people more qualified than me to deal with issues to do with intelligence to the degree that they can. I know much more about it than even I, I do, although I was the Secretary of State. But it, I, I do remember that um, New Zealand adopted a particular position in relation to United States ships and nuclear weapons and found themselves cut out of communication with the United States, who are the key intelligence partner in the world, for almost two decades. Um, and I, I, just, I just think that's worthy of, of consideration when one is adopting a position, positions which are 
mutually contradictory, but may have consequences. Um, but my, my real interest is in the, the way in which the issue to do with uh, procurement was answered. Um, Angus, I think, was very careful in the way in which he answered this question, but the, the, the headline facts for Scotland are that we have a number of global um, UK defence contractors based in Scotland, and of the prime contractors, not the SMEs, of the prime contractors that the UK MOD contract with, BA Systems, Raytheon, Rolls-Royce, Celex Galileo, Thales, and Babcock Marine are all in Scotland. Now, I don't know what SMEs get in Scotland, and I'm prepared to accept that the answers that, 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 uh, that, that were given, but the fact of the matter is that currently, the UK MOD spend about £1.8 billion pounds per year in Scotland, and they support 10,000 jobs. Now, it's not... It's not, it's not, no, just, just a moment. I didn't interrupt you, please. Um, we, we, these are the headline figures. If you, you can disaggregate them and say there are issues about SMEs and there will be issues about SMEs in all parts of the regions of the United Kingdom apart from possibly one. But, but those are the headline figures. Also important is that of the UK's orders, 12 to 13 billion of them are exempt from EU regulations. So the placing of these orders in the United Kingdom is allowed because they're exempt from EU regulations. If Scotland was a separate member of the, uh, 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 of, of, of the European Union, then they would not be exempt from EU regulations. These are all, I, don't, I, I haven't worked out in the detail what the implications of all of this are, but these are the implications. And there is no point in dressing them up in any other way. And the final point, of course, is that we are an island state. The maintenance of our industrial capability to support, particularly our maritime defence, is crucially important to our security. A significant amount of it, I mean, I, I have to say, I think this is a point that's lost in this present government um, to a degree when they, when they look back at some of the decisions that I and others made, but the maintenance of this capability is part of our defence. It's expensive to do, and a significant part of it is in Scotland. Now, there is no reason to believe, no matter how well we go on with each other, that if EU regulations and other arguments mean that the rest of the UK can do it cheaper or are subject to political pressures to do it elsewhere, that these jobs will stay in Scotland. Scotland could easily become no matter how good a neighbour the rest of the UK was, a country without the capability to be able to sustain its maritime defence and utterly dependent on, on other countries to provide it. Now, that, that wouldn't need any malice. It would just happen over time almost inevitably because of the dynamic of procurement. And just my final point is, Denmark is not a decent comparator. Because Denmark did not become independent in the 21st century. And if Denmark became independent in the 21st century, then it would be. Because it would then have to build the capital infrastructure that supports its existing military capabilities. And comparing a military and security budget with a defence budget, a military budget, is not a true comparator in any event. You have to aggregate the two of them if you're to compare, because that's what the SNP have chosen to do. Uh, Ming. Very quickly, Malcolm Rifkin may want to say more about Five Eyes and his capacity as chairman of the uh, Intelligence and Security Committee. But I'd just like to make this observation. The strongest of these relationships, this is no secret, is between the United Kingdom and the United States. The United States regards the relationship as being fundamentally important. That is why when the proceedings in Binya Muhammad appeared to have an impact upon the control principle. Uh, that is to say, if, you're, if intelligence is provided, you're under an obligation not to reveal it. <laughs>